Think about what it's like to walk into a room filled with people. Whatever we believe about who the people are or what they think of us has a direct impact in how we respond to and interact with them. If we believe they're angry, we're likely to be defensive. If we believe they are judgmental, we will be guarded. In each case, we will certainly not walk into that room in trust. On the other hand, if we believe the people in the room are happy, we're more likely to be receptive. If we believe they are good people who truly care about us, we will be more open and able to be ourselves. We will find greater trust and even a greater ability to think beyond ourselves while we're here for others. It is this way also in our relationship with God. You see, we have power over what we believe and what we believe has power over us. Do you primarily see God as a loving creator who walks with us, offering love, joy, and peace? Or do you more often see God like a judicious ruler who keeps records of every action we take? What we believe about God makes a huge difference in the way we live. And if you're anything like me, unhealthy views of God have a way of sneaking into our thinking. So during last week's uh, Sunday school session, a very important question was raised. How do we reconcile the love and grace of Jesus evident in the New Testament with what often seems like harsh judgment and condemnation from God in the Old Testament? If that's your question, that's what we're going to address today. So I'm really excited about this session. Um, I loved that question when it was asked last week, and I, and I gave an answer to it. I'd actually been doing some thinking on this, not only in the last week, but over the last few years. And I wanted to share with you some things that I presented in a couple other formats um, on this idea of what kind of king. And underneath this, uh, gets at that question of how do we reconcile some of what we see in the Old Testament in the character and nature of God and the New Testament. From Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when it was that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you, and the king will answer, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those that is left, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. Stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not care for you? And he will answer, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into way into eternal punishment and the righteous to eternal life. I'm sure this is a passage that you are familiar with. And this helps us get at this question of how do we reconcile um, the love of Jesus that we most often see 
with some of the condemnation and judgment that we see of God in the Old Testament. So from this, we will begin. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Do you believe that? I believe it, but if I'm completely honest with myself, I don't always believe it. And I closely identify with the man who met Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. There are times more than I'm probably even aware of that unhealthy beliefs about God slip into my thinking. Thoughts like, why would God do this to me? Or even the ever, ever popular, everything happens for a reason. Thoughts like these can easily lead me down a subtle path towards a different view of God, one that uses power to coerce and control us into right behavior. And I'm not alone in this. If you remember from a few weeks ago, I went through these stats. Uh, it's probably about a month ago. I'm going to go through them again. A Baylor University study studying uh, people of the Christian faith all over our country found that 25% of American Christians view God as loving or beneficent. Okay. Well, what about these? 31% of American Christians believe God is an authoritarian God. 23% of American Christians believe in a distant God. And 16% of Americans believe in a critical God. The way we view God directly impacts the way we experience life. And some of you remember Dr. Tim Jennings, who did our uh, Mental Health Matters a couple years ago. And he spent more than 25 years studying the neurobiology of belief. And he says this, we have power over what we believe, but what we believe holds power over us. See, beliefs of control and coercion incite fear and are damaging to the brain, body, and relationships, while beliefs of love and freedom promote giving and are healing to the brain, body, and relationships. It's so interesting to hear him unpack that and show the scientific evidence. So today, we are going to look at what kind of king Christ is. So in our Western world, the king language is not common. And it's far too easy to let the wrong idea about Christ as our king enter our minds. At the same time, it's a perfect opportunity for us to clarify and remind ourselves about the goodness of our king and the kind of kingdom that Jesus represents. So today we're going to consider how correctly understanding the kingship of Christ can transform not only our view of God, but actually also the way we live. So in 2 Corinthians, we're going to use a lot of scripture, and I'll come back to the one from Matthew here in a little bit. But in 2 Corinthians, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The deepest part of our human struggle takes place in our minds, in how we think about God and life. Ultimately, we're in a war over who we believe God to be. That's the knowledge of God. It's a battle we've faced since day one. Looking back at the Garden of Eden, what was the original temptation? We talked about this at Easter. Was it to eat the apple? Was it to disobey God? Those were actually the results of the temptation that the serpent presented to Adam and Eve. The original temptation was to believe a lie about God. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
See, this is why Satan is referred to as the father of lies. And again, I referred to this on my Easter message. The serpent sought to change Adam and Eve's belief about God. And it was in believing that lie that everything changed. From that moment forward, fear and self-protection entered the human race. Our daily struggle is ultimately one of trust in who we believe God to be at its most basic level. It comes down to this accurate understanding of God's character and how he governs, the truth of who we are and how God works his power. And you've heard me share, this has slipped into my thinking so, so much. And the, the question raised last week of how do we reconcile these different understandings of, of God is really at the core issue of that. So I want to consider a few questions today. So we ask these of yourself. Do you see God primarily as loving creator or more as a judicious ruler? I'll clarify for myself. For everyone else, I see God as a loving creator. For myself, I often see God as a judicious ruler. I know more about myself. <laughs> Do you think there might be a reason that the Bible uses ferocious beasts to represent earthly governments, but a lamb to represent Christ our King? As humans, we come to understand things by how we experience them. And our primary understanding of government is through uh, law and justice. So is God's administration of law and justice the same as the world's? So I'm going to pause here for a minute. I'm hearing a lot of people come in and out. So I don't know if we're getting uh, this fixed or not today. Um, anyone have any comments at this point? Anyone have any comments? Hey, Jim. Yes. Um, I do have a comment about Matthew, the passage, Matthew 31 through 46. Yeah, Chris. It seems to me like it also applies very closely to today. Like, uh, like yesterday, I, Sandra Rogers called me, so I went over and visited with her for a minute. Because she was feeling kind of, Tom had went somewhere and she was feeling alone. So, I, I guess it, to me, it, it applies very much to today. Thank you very much, Christy. I appreciate that. Yeah. And if you could mute yourself again, that would be helpful to so that the phone doesn't make background noises. Thank you. Anyone else? And we're going to come back to that passage. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I got into a discussion a long time ago from a, um, with a fellow Christian, but who was from a Calvinist, uh, background. Yeah. And very, very, very strictly. <laughs> and the, 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 the disagreement we had was we both agreed that God was all sovereign and God is uh, all powerful. And that um, he is just. And so as sovereign um, and completely just, we are, from his point of view, it was the, uh, the old um, sinners in the hands of an angry God. We have the, uh, he has the total authority and the total right to do anything he wants to with us and judge us accordingly, which is very Old Testament. <laughs> but, uh, and I agreed that, yes, he is all sovereign and all powerful and has a total right to do anything he wants to with us, including apply grace. Yeah. And that, at that point, we had to agree to disagree. <laughs> but, uh, um, that's a really good way to articulate it, Mike. And, and that is, you know, I mean, we do come at different views and how do we hold, how do we hold those views in, in a healthy tension? Um, there's actually a book that this last week I got asked to post a book a day of favorite books. And I posted a book on the day one called Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it just takes a little different view. And, 
and I like how you articulated that. And actually, we're about to, that's a really good segue into what we're about to go into because we're about to look at what is justice. So anyone else a comment before I segue into Mike's comments? Thank you all so much. Good, good. So I'm, I'm going further on this question. Is God's administration of law and justice the same as the world's? So Jesus said this, my kingdom is not of this world. So how is it different? So let's first look at law. There are two ways to understand law. A legal set of written rules that are imposed or a more natural understanding of how the world works, like the law of gravity. In the legal view, there are rules that if we don't obey God, we're punished. In the natural view, when we make a choice to live outside the law, we experience consequences. For instance, if we step off the roof of a 10-story building, the law of gravity has taught us we're going to fall. Legal laws and punishments can change, but natural laws, no matter how we explain them, remain the same. Both of these views can have their place in our faith, but I'd like to propose that because we primarily emphasize the legal view of God's law, our view of God easily slips into that of a judicious ruler and the source of punishment. But when we view God through the lens of natural law, we understand that we were created in God's image to have authority in the world within God's vision of perfect freedom and love. Again, this is from Dr. Jennings again. He talks a lot about this. The life principle that emanates from God's very being because God is love. Love is not enacted, legislated, or imposed. It's the natural order of all things arising from the God of love. This law of love is the design template upon which God has constructed all of life to operate and is described throughout scripture. This is the difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law and why Jesus taught that the greatest commandment is love and ultimately the fulfillment of the law. So let's consider justice now. And Mike was talking about that. So we know on September 20th, a uh, week after 2000, uh, or 9-11, excuse me, um, after the terrorist attack, President George W. Bush said to a joint session of Congress, whether we bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. So when we hear this, we all understand what he meant by justice. The United States will hunt down and inflict punishment upon those responsible for the heinous crime that happened on 9-11. Is this the same way that God exercises justice? Some ways of how we understand the Old Testament would say so. However, look at some passages on justice. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. From Psalm 82. From Isaiah 1. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their right. And defend widows. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. The Lord is a God of justice. And from Jeremiah, this is what the Lord says to the dynasty of David. Give justice each morning to the people you judge. Help those who have been robbed. Rescue them from their oppressors. In God's kingdom, justice is always about delivering the oppressed, not punishing the oppressor. Hear that again. In God's kingdom, Justice is always about delivering the oppressed and not punishing the oppressor. Yet, when we view God's justice primarily through a legal lens, we easily stand in fear of God's justice. I wonder if this is the reason why almost every time someone is first approached by the divine in scripture, they're greeted with the words, do not be afraid. It's so easy for us to slip into a fearful view of God 
without even realizing it. Walking through this life this way changes us and puts us in a mode of defensiveness, self-protection, even in the most subtle of ways. When we think of God in legal terms, it's easy to think of Jesus and God in opposing ways. Jesus is love who saves us from sin, and God primarily as judge who will account for our sin. In this view, who inflicts the punishment? God. Yet, when we view law beyond legal terms as the way God designed the world to work, we understand that living out of harmony with God's law leads to brokenness, distrust, and even death, not at the hands of God, but rather at sin working in us. Richard Rohr says it this way, we are not punished for our sin, we are punished by our sin. Any comments here? I'm gonna keep going, but any further comments on justice or law? All right, let me keep going. So what does Jesus say on this part? Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I think we read this last week too. In John 17, I have made your very being known to them. This is Jesus talking. Who you are and what you do and continue to make it known so that your love for me might be in them exactly as I am in them. Jesus didn't come to restore God's vision of us. Jesus came to restore our vision of God and win us back to trust from the enemy's lies that so easily slip into our thinking. Jesus wasn't changing God's mind. He was revealing God's heart of absolute, unconditional love for us. Here's a quote from Augustine. Does this mean that the Son of God was already so reconciled to us that he was even prepared to die for us while the Father was still so angry with us that unless the Son died for us, he would not be reconciled? The Father loved us not merely before the Son died for us, but before he founded the world. Rachel Held Evans, I shared this on Easter Sunday. The good news is that God looks like Jesus. Want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. And Philip Yancey, um, another author and theologian, said it this way. Because of Jesus... I must adjust my instinct instinctive notions about God. Jesus reveals a God who comes in search of us, a God who makes room for our freedom, even when it costs the son's life, a God who is vulnerable. Above all, Jesus reveals a God who is love. This is our king, and this is the kind of kingdom Christ represents, one where love reigns. A world where we don't have to be paralyzed in fear by our brokenness, but rather can trust God with it. So consider this. The example of a heroin addict who was born to a broken family, raised by an angry parent, and turned to drugs to cope with life. Years of drug caused damage to his brain, and dirty needles infected his body. Which understanding of God and his kingdom would be more helpful? Being presented with all his sin before God as a judge, but defended by Jesus who takes his penalty and sets him legally free. So picture that addict in the courtroom being represented by Jesus in front of God, and he's set legally free. Is that our understanding of God? Or being met by Christ on the way, brought to God as creator and healer, so that all that has happened to him and all that he has done might be fully revealed, brought to the surface, and a remedy with Christ prescribed. So everything's still revealed, but then the remedy is prescribed instead of judgment. 
The judgment comes naturally. The remedy is what God offers us. Which of these has more power to bring life? To which understanding of God would the man prefer to have all his sin revealed? As the judge or as the healer? This is why the King David in Psalms, and specifically Psalm 139, can say, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a God we can trust completely. So God calls us to discover the truth that will set us free and open our minds and our hearts to experience the power of God's love. And as I love to say, love with a capital L, which can transform and restore us to God's original design. Back to the perfection of love as, re as revealed in Christ Jesus, our good King. So, in closing, you might be asking what uh, any of this has to do with the scripture lesson today. And um, the sheep and the goats, which often gives us this sense of uh, judgment in the legal set of the terms. Um, so, throughout scripture... The image of the good shepherd is used to reflect God. It's the image of one who cares for us, who comes after us when we are lost, and who protects us. When we only view the gospel through a judicious ruler lens, this passage is seen as one of judgment for those who don't behave. It becomes all about punishment instead of protection. In this passage, we are assured that Christ's kingdom is one where there's no more hunger, there's no more thirst, no more loneliness, no more nakedness, sickness, or imprisonment, because those who live there trust the love and provision of their king. There's no need to hoard or self-protect, and all can live there and give there freely. Distrust and selfishness will have no place in God's kingdom. So Jesus' description of the goats is like a diagnosis of what will happen when we distrust and when distrust and self-protection fills our minds. As Oswald Chambers in his famous devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, says, condemnation comes when I realize that Jesus Christ came to deliver me from this heredity of sin, and yet I refuse to let him do so. C.S. Lewis put it this way, the doors of hell are locked from the inside. Christ our King reveals to us a God who seeks us, who will let nothing, even death, separate us from the love of the Father. So all who seek shall find, and all who the door will be opened. See, the death of Christ reveals how far God goes to restore us, to trust in God's image, and our value as God's beloved children. The resurrection of Christ reveals that no power can ever separate us from God's love and goodness created into the core of every human being. Jesus wasn't changing God's mind. He was revealing God's heart of absolute, unconditional love for and with us. So whenever we look, and I like how Mike put it, at how we understand the sovereignty of God, how do we look at it through the lens of the living word? When scripture talks about the word of God, it is not talking about the written scripture. It is talking about Jesus. So how do we see the descriptions of God throughout scripture through the lens of the living word, Jesus? All right. Any questions or comments here? I'm going to come off of this. Any questions or comments? I have a couple other things I want to share generically, but any questions or comments? I heard lots of people coming in and out, so I'm sorry if technology wasn't keeping up with us. Go ahead, Rybolts. I had a question, uh, maybe more uh, in the agriculture area that you're familiar with, but do you know, when we hear about the sheep and that part a lot, do you know why goats would be used at the time and would that have a jump out to the people at the time in a way that doesn't to us i do not know but boy you are so good at asking questions i need to look at that one. thank you 
Yeah, why did he use goats and sheep? Tom, I'll look that up. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was just thinking about like my own perspective with um, considering if you're approaching a, a judge versus someone who cares about you and a judge is, I don't know, someone who's foreign, they are going to choose, did you do what's right or did you do what's wrong? Or, um, you know, someone who is going to love and accept you no matter what you did. And I even just thought about like our call to confession and forgiveness and, um, I don't know just how, how hard all of that is if you are approaching a judge, but, um, when you're approaching a loving father, it's pretty easy to talk about, you know, what's, yeah. what's going on. So I love that. And think about it. Who would you prefer to be exposed? All of your stuff exposed in front of a judge or a doctor. <laughs> they, both, <laughs> they both could be hard, right? But when you go to the doctor, you want to know what's wrong. Because you trust that then that's going to expose it so that you can begin to find healing. But if you go to a judge, you don't want what is wrong exposed. <laughs> so that's the, the different view. And these things just so subtly get into our mind. So that question last week of how do we understand God of the Old Testament? Again, that could be a huge study in taking passage after passage. But how do we look at it through the lens of Jesus, of our King? I, I thought, Jim, that the, um, your segment on the Old Testament um, view of justice and that it was delivering the oppressed, that really brought the Old Testament and the New Testament together for me because in every instance where Jesus was in a position to be able to judge and condemn, like with the adulteress or the woman at the well, he, he it, instead he delivered grace. And so I hadn't really ever put those two together before. So that was, that was so revealing to me. That means so, I mean, obviously it first comes out of the Old Testament, but some conversations I've had with Kevin and Kevin does this thing, if you can see my hands, where justice is about this. It's about, you know, people coming to a common place, lifting the poor. And often that in doing that, what happens is the, the rich, and I'm talking those things metaphorically, but then there has to be an equal weight of distribution of things. And so God is always about equality. Mother Teresa said it, there's enough in the world for people's need, but not enough for people's greed. So justice is always bringing people to the same playing field, mm -hmm. same level. Jim, I wonder, you know, the notion of a loving father is something as a sinful person. I'm greatly appreciative that our faith embraces all of us in a way that, that isn't judgmental, but why do you think then your initial Baylor University study indicates so many people, even a majority of people, would embrace a God who isn't loving? That is such a good question. Um, it's not new, right? I mean, I, we see it in our culture now. Um, people don't trust Christians right now. So I think there's some unique things. And you see the way that Christianity is often represented in an egotistical judgmental way. Drew talked about this recently in a sermon where when there was a research done and the first words that come to people's mind of non-Christians for Christians is judgmental and hypocritical. So I think that's part of our, com or our current cultural climate. But if you look throughout scripture from the original temptation, it's always about trying to see God in that um, the temptation is always about seeing God in that fearful light, right? <laughs> um, from the original temptation. And then you look throughout scripture and it's the same thing. God trying to come and, and reconcile people and say, no, that's not who I am. <laughs> um, I'm about this kind of justice, as Vicki just said. I'm about this. And I do really think that's why uh, every time you see the divine show up in scripture, the first word is, do not be afraid. Um, but it's not new. I think we have a unique cultural climate right now, um, but it's not new. So, and, and I recognize it in myself. Again, 
uh, even though I've shared this in previous weeks, but Dr. Jennings, when I was seeing him, said this was a big part of why I was struggling with depression at some level. And I didn't believe him. <laughs> I'm like, no, I always talk about God as good and loving. But I compare what I know about myself to what I don't know about other people, and I lose. Oh, I did it again. Why can't you get it right, Jim? You know, and those thoughts in some ways were subtly linked to this view of God I had for myself, walking on eggshells, you know. Oh, I confessed that yesterday, but I just did it again today, <laughs> kind of thing. Other thoughts? I'm going to share uh, a video with you. Let's see if it works. And um, you can just hear it. That's okay, too, if we're struggling with that. I've got to come back to share screen. It's going to be in two parts. Um, let me do this. A lot of, if you want to go deeper with a lot of this, um, there is a book called The God-Shaped Heart from Dr. Jennings that is on this theme, okay? But uh, there's a lot of books that I've found that are written on it. It wasn't this Dr. Jennings, but that's where I first got introduced to it. There is another book that's called A More Christ-Like God, and I'm going to share just the intro that he had for that. Oh, back up. Hold on. What is God like? Every one of us has an image of God that we hold in our hearts and minds. Some of us received our ideas of God through indoctrination in whatever religion we grew up in. Others of us developed our idea of God through life experiences. Believers and atheists alike often embrace or reject images of God that are toxic. These distortions of God need to be cleansed from our hearts because inevitably we mimic the God we imagine. Some notions of God are extremely harsh. God the tyrant king. God the punitive judge. God the abusive step parent. God the mighty smiter. Others see God as someone they can manipulate like a doting grandparent, the genie in a lantern, or the divine sugar daddy. On the other hand, some imagine God as a deadbeat dad, absent, delinquent, unsupportive and uncaring, the God who wasn't there when I needed him. Well, that was going to be my intro this morning. I decided to skip it. I'm going to come down, play the rest of that from here, see where he goes. In a more Christ-like God, we ask, if there is a God, what is he like? Scripture tells us that God is love. And specifically, it says that if you want to see this God of love, you look at Jesus. God with skin. God incarnate. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. The Apostle Paul said, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. All the fullness of God was embodied in him. Hebrews 1 says, Jesus perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's own nature. In a more Christ-like God, we'll look at Jesus' life, the way he treated people, the way he loved people. We look at the way he cared for those on the margins and looked after the abused. And also, we'll even see that he could face down the religious abusers and the spiritual bullies. At the same time, the clearest image of God comes into focus in Christ crucified. In a more Christ-like God, we ask, what does the cross show us about God? That God is love, self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. Self-giving in that God has poured himself into our world as love incarnate. Radically forgiving because even when wicked men murdered him, he forgave them. And co-suffering because he has chosen to experience the depths of the human condition, including suffering and death, and he overcame it all. 
And so we see that God is like Jesus, exactly like Jesus. God is Christ-like because Christ is God the Son. In a more Christ-like God, we're going to experience an achingly beautiful gospel. A gospel that does not say God is too righteous and holy to look on sinners, but if you turn to him, then he'll forgive you. Rather, we'll encounter the Christ-like God who has always loved you. The God revealed in Jesus is always with you, always for you, always in pursuit of you. God, the shepherd who goes down into the ditch to find the sheep tangled in the weeds. God, the father who runs to welcome the wayward child back home. God, the crucified Lord, who, while we were enemies, while we were sinners, while we were ignorant of him, reconciled us to himself. So I hope you'll join us in a more Christ-like God, a more beautiful gospel, as we discover the cruciform God, the cross-shaped God, who knows you, loves you, and wants you to know him. You know, in some ways, I know we all know this, but why this has become such a theme for me is because I see it sneaking in um, so often in myself. And then I, I really believe it's at the core of why so many in our culture um, are struggling to see God that way. There was one phrase that um, Brad Jerzak just said that Dr. Jennings talks about. Um, when we talk about natural law versus legal law, Dr. Jennings talks about the law of love, the law of justice, the law of freedom. He also talks about the law of worship. And in psychology terms, it's called modeling. You become like the God you worship. That is scientifically proven. You become like the God you worship. So if and when you see people who are on the street corner who are preaching a very legalistic um, judgmental God, that is the God they're living with. It's coming out that way. Um, and then when we have a God of love, we express it that way. Dr. Jennings also talks about meditation and the benefits of meditation. And that um, if you meditate on a God of love, 10 minutes a day, scientific research, um, in 30 days, you have grown brain cells. <laughs> if you meditate on a God of judgment and anger, 30 days, you will have diminishing brain cells. It's really, really interesting. He goes into a lot of that. Some of you may have heard that in one of our mental health things. All right, any comments and then we'll do prayer requests. Uh, Karen, can I, are you okay? You can say no. Are you okay to pray for us today? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Let's, let's pray. Okay. Um, God, thank you so much because you are present with us. Thank you that we can go to you with the confidence um, that you are a loving father, um, that you offer us justice and grace, and God, you call us to offer that to others. And so, um, God, I just pray for your healing for each of us, for our own perspective and our beliefs about you, God, that we would um, really come to know who you are so that we could live that out um, to our family, our friends, um, the community around us, God, so that they would also um, know your love and your truth. Um, and God, we um, just pray for the church during this time um, that they would be given wisdom um, for the timing and, and the ways to reopen um, and for um, the graduates this year and for those dealing with health challenges as well. God, just um, continue to give your presence and show your love to them. In Jesus' name, amen. And that makes me think of one thing too. So as you share your faith, Drew is talking about that this morning of what it means to share your faith without being a jerk. <laughs> he didn't title it that way, but he joked about titling it that way. One of the things that I've heard and now I'm beginning to experience at the mental health hospital, one of the best ways to share your faith is praying um, for people. Uh, so 
uh, lately at the mental health hospital, it's just people are now without me asking, coming up and asking, can I pray with them? And I simply ask this question, how can I best pray for you right now? And then I pray for them right in that moment. And so it's just, it's a really cool way to not just tell about God, but to be Jesus with skin on and to represent God for them in that moment. Almost every time when someone comes up and I finish praying, um, there's tears in their eyes. And that is a powerful way of evangelism, coupled with what Drew is talking about today of how to best represent our God. Um, it's, it's just been a really powerful way. And story, story, how God has worked for you. So I thank you all so, so much. Again, we have a new form of worship coming here at 11 online. Uh, all of this will be available, um, including this lesson. I will make it available tomorrow, I think. Um, so you can, if you had trouble seeing things today, you should be able to, if technology works, see it tomorrow again as well, as well as the service and everything like that. So thank you all so much. Very, very much. So good to see you. Have an awesome, awesome day. Love you all. Can't wait to see you soon, <laughs> whenever soon is. <laughs> all right. Talk to you soon.